Hey, hey, welcome to Page Break. I'm Brian McClellan, coming to you on a blisteringly hot day in the mountains of Utah. And today I am not your host, because it is the launch of my new epic fantasy novel, In the Shadow of Lightning. To celebrate, we've switched things up a bit. Your host today is my very good friend, celebrated author and friend of Page Break, Dan Wells. Dan has been kind enough to come on and make today's Page Break all about me. Dan's guest today is me, epic fantasy author Brian McClellan. I'm best known for the Powder Mage universe that spans six novels, as well as numerous novellas and short stories. I've also written the ongoing Valkyrie Collections Urban Fantasy, and I'm normally the host of this podcast, Page Break with Brian McClellan. And as I've been beating you dear listeners over the head with these past few weeks, I've got a new book out today. In the Shadow of Lightning is the first entry into a brand new epic fantasy universe, Glass Immortals. Dan and I talk extensively about Glass Immortals, including the evolution of the magic system and the various characters from early draft to what we now see on the page. We also talk about what becoming a published author did for my self-confidence, the writerly skill sets I tried to expand for the new series, and the future of my novella-length spin-offs. Enjoy Dan's conversation with me! <coughs> Right, so Brian, you have a brand new book, which is the first of a brand new series. Indeed. In the Shadow of Lightning. I remember you have been working on this for a long time. Yes. Uh, and I know that this went through several uh, extensive drafts, but how long has the idea itself been like percolating in the back of your brain? Oh man, like, like there's some pieces of idea that ended up in this book that probably go back six or seven years but like the the book as something that is kind of turning into you know like a real thing uh probably about about four years i think four years and what was like the initial impetus of it was it i want to do a magic system based on glass or was it one of the characters like demir like where what was the original seed of this idea uh, both of those things actually come from two different kind of seed ideas. One of them was that I wanted to do glass in some way with the magic system. And and I had been fiddling with things. It's funny because I like a lot of it was driving home from your house after game night <laughs> late, like at one o'clock in the morning and having that, you know, 45 minute drive to just think about things. And uh, and I would be listening to like the Revolutions podcast uh, that would give me, you know, kind of this political thriller vibes kind of mm-hmm. stuff that I wanted to play with. And, uh, and yeah, and I was thinking about the magic. Um, I had like these vague ideas about like uh, demon summoners who use these like special magic glass baubles that to trap demons and that never really went anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, I had a few different things and they, and they all kind of started to roll together eventually. Like, cause that was, you know, way back then, that was before I finished Powder Mage. Yeah. And so I was supposed to be working on book six of Powder Mage. And, you know, I had some evenings I would let myself kind of daydream about whatever the next project was. Some listener just got really excited about demon summoners who trap demons in glass. <laughs> and then you immediately crushed their dreams. And they're like, well, screw this. I'm not going to read this dumb book now. That's that's fine. That's We didn't want that guy to read it anyway. So let's let's back up a little bit uh and let's introduce this book dear listener out there if you've never heard of in the shadow of lightning before brian give us the the quick pitch for this what's the elevator pitch uh so the elevator pitch is that this is a world in which it feels about 1800s uh napoleonic so similar to powder mage in that way um but uh it's a world in which magic has become industrialized uh it is not necessarily inherent it is something that is um it is made and anybody mm-hmm. can use it but obviously your status in life kind of determines how the goods if you can afford the good stuff so it's an industrial magic uh this great empire that basically you know half rules the world imagine imagine the british empire at their height yeah and they do so because they are the greatest exporter and creator of god glass um and uh so this empire is ruled by guild families 
which is uh, it, swing around from British Empire to Medici kind of, um, <laughs> you know, Italian, uh, you know, whether you want to go for Italian Renaissance or Italian, like a, a late Roman Republic kind of thing. Um, but these massive guild families who who basically run everything. And our main character is the scion of one of the minor guild families. He was a child prodigy who j- absolutely brilliant, the best mm-hmm. at everything he tried to do. And then he had a mental breakdown and basically fled out into the provinces, disappeared, became a grifter, just kind of uh, wandering for nine years until right at the beginning of the book, uh, he finds out that his mother has been murdered and he is immediately has to come home because he has to take over as the patriarch of his guild family and uh, immediately finds out r- as soon as he gets home that the magic, this industrial magic is running out. They're running out of what it takes to make God glass. Um, and it basically that those, those two big things, um, Demir Grappo and his mother's murder and the disappearance of God glass is basically what spurs the entire series really. But you know, especially here, book one. Yeah. I love this description because it is such a distinctly Brian McClellan story, right? <laughs> uh, the premise that magic is industrialized more than anything else, I think, is what sets this apart. And it obviously shares a writing style with your powder mage stuff. But the what what really sells it to me as a distinct entry into the McClellan repertoire is this sense that you're kind of taking the sense of wonder out of magic while still having sense of wonder there. You know, yeah. like this yeah. is down and gritty and people can do this stuff and the story is wondrous, but the magic itself is just like, oh yeah, there's this thing I got to do and there's this stuff and here's all the underpaid labor that toils away in factories to make the magic that we're all using. And I just love that aspect of it. And I think it's so distinct. Uh, I don't know of anyone else who approaches magic from that angle, which is really cool. Well, I mean, even with Powder Mage, I really loved the concept of kind of utilitarian magic, Mm -hmm. you know, like magic that is, I don't know, like uh, magics that, that is used very particularly to prop up a portion of society, not necessarily just, you know, awesome wizards, but you know, like society depends on this and it kind of runs on, you know, the different ways that magic can kind of improve people's lives or just make people more effective um, there's parts in the book where I talk about how, uh, you know, the teamsters have to have forge glass to make them stronger. Otherwise they can't do their jobs. Yeah. They can't haul all the crap for the guild families. <laughs> and so I love this idea of a, of, of magic that is, it's so inherently essential to every fabric of society, not just, you know, like, you know, the guys up in their towers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and uh, that concept of magic not being genetic, which is so endemic to so much of fantasy. Um, Obviously there are counter examples, but you know, so many fantasy series, so many fantasy worlds kind of fall back on this, you know, the chosen one can do magic. Uh, You know, in the Harry Potter series, magic is essentially genetic access to guns. Like that's what it does. And in yours, you do have glass dancers uh, who they seem to be, you know, innately talented or they have some kind of predisposition to a magic no one else can access uh but then you've also got and i can't remember the word for them the people who you know are genetically can't do magic at all the people who cannot be affected by it cannot use uh the god glass but also then can't experience the side effects that god glass creates but most of the people 95 percent of the world is in the middle yeah well and i i liked having those variations you know because even you know it's that's that's kind of in our own world. That's how things are, you know. Like mm-hmm. some people have a peanut allergy, um, you know. In in the the world of glass immortals, there are people who have literally an allergy to god glass, and it it makes them kind of itch under the armpits when they use it too much. And uh, there are people who are completely immune to its effects, both good and bad. And so, and that's sorcery aphasics. And, uh, and there are also people who don't suffer the consequences 
of God glass nearly as bad as others. And those people tend to be you know, kind of recruited into the military because they can keep using things like forge glass for a very long time without getting sick. Yeah. And that's uh, Idrian, the breacher. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Adrian Sapulki. Yeah, he has all of this awesome, like, armor and weapons and stuff that he can use more fully and for longer time periods than anybody else. And so he's like the human tank when he's all geared up, which is very cool. Um, so, and and I, I do love that earlier you mentioned the Revolutions podcast, because I was going to ask about that, because you're the one who got me into it. And then as soon as I started reading this book, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I can see a lot of that DNA in here. Uh, that idea of, you know, this is a historical political thriller where we get to see, you know, 500 different perspectives on the same ongoing story. Uh, it's a podcast by Mike Duncan. It's really wonderful where he will go into, you know, this is what the politicians were doing. But at the same time, this is what the military was doing. And this is what somebody in this other place was doing. And here's what, you know, the press was doing. And here's this random, like, farm girl who ended up assassinating some important dude. And you, you've you captured that same sense that kind of sweeping historical scope uh in the book in the shadow of lightning because we have and this is common to epic fantasy you have so many different characters but you've really gone out of your way to put them all in different castes of society and with distinctly different uh outlooks on the world which i think is really cool well and, and that's something that i do try when i'm designing kind of the characters i want for a new epic fantasy that's something i try to do specifically because if i have two different people that are point of view characters that i'm commonly writing from and they're both soldiers, and they're both the same type of soldier, I'm not getting that big of a difference. <laughs> I mean, even back in Powder Mage, Tomas and Taniel are father and son. They're both soldiers. They're both Powder Mages. But one of them is a field marshal, and one of them is kind of the in-the-trenches soldier. And so you get very different kind of perspective on, uh, perspectives on how things are running in you know a war or the politics or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I... I do. I really like that. Um, and and I employed that in this. Um, Demir is a politician at heart. He's a skilled commander on a battlefield, but he very much prefers people like talking and conniving and scheming and things like that. Um, Tessa is a she's an engineer. She works in a workshop. She makes things. Um, she makes god glass. Idrian is a soldier, and uh, he. He is there to protect the rest of his battalion with his gigantic armored shield and his m massive skills on the battlefield. He's, he's called a breacher. He's literally sent in to break the enemy lines. And then we've got uh, Kizzy. Uh, and Kizzy is an enforcer. She's a, she's a bastard from one of the guild families who's become a favored enforcer who is sent to break legs or kill people when necessary. And so every single one of them has a very different perspective on life. Yeah. Kizzy is my favorite one to read about so far. Demir, I think I like the best. But Kizzy is the one who, when we get into her perspective, I know that I'm going to see very competent murder and law breaking. And I just, I really go in for that. I think it's a lot of fun to get into her perspective and see how, how successfully and how cleverly she is able to be a horrible person, <laughs> which is wonderful. Um, were there any uh, angles or character types or perspectives that were new to you in this one? Because you've done politics before, you've done intrigue before, you've done war, you know, soldiers before. Um, were, were there any, like, what did you, if anything, what did you try to do that was new in this book, character-wise? Um, that would definitely be Tessa. The um, she's a silicier. She's a magical engineer. That's such a good word. And uh, and and I uh, and and she's base. She's the one that was hardest to write for me because I something common to epic fantasy that I have always avoided is kind of spending a lot of time with the the kind of the roots of the world and the magic system. Um, I've always kind of blown past that. And I've tried to focus on the here and now and the story that's being propelled forward. And I really decided I wanted to try to kind of dig into the magic in ways that I hadn't really in previous books of mine. And Tessa is my, uh, is my way of doing that. She is my window into 
how this how magic makes the world turn. And I've never done that before. And it's it's a little weird to write because I am someone who's whose writing tends to be action oriented. That, that's that's what propels my plot forward. Even even you know the political angles mm-hmm. are usually you know people rushing here and there to do things. And having a character who's best in a spot where she has to stop and think and figure out a problem quietly, like an engineer does, that was a very weird thing for me to try to tackle. <laughs> is is that? far removed from your own skill set, do you think? Because you seem like a very kind of methodical, think things through kind of a person. I think epic fantasy authors have to be. I, I mean, as a human being, that's exactly who I am. But as some, <laughs> as a writer, like my kind of practiced abilities as a writer are all based on keeping the action moving. You know, like yeah. I, I've, I've said before, when I started writing Powder Mage, I wanted to write a epic fantasy that was paced more like an urban fantasy. And uh and 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 when you do something like that, you kind of have to scrap a lot of the things that epic fantasy is known for, yeah. like giant feast scenes and things like that, right? <laughs> um stopping to describe everybody's clothing. And so yeah, I uh I guess I guess it's just it's not something I'm practiced with. Interesting. So uh, how did you do it? Just trial and error, write a bunch of stuff and eventually got good at it? Or was there some specific tactic that you chose to help get into that headspace? Um, honestly, it was it was a bit of both. I, I did do a lot of kind of writing trial and error, more than I normally do. I'm one of those people that usually like lets things sit in their head for a long time and then writes a draft and that's like it. And in the shadow of lightning was not like that at all. Like you mentioned earlier, I, it went through several drafts that I wasn't quite happy with and, uh, and had to keep kind of massaging and rewriting to get them to work. And the reason for that was because, um, especially with Tessa's point of view, uh, what I had to do to kind of make her work for my style of writing was to ma- to really weave her character arc into the other characters in really, um, in really essential ways. She's not there with everyone from the beginning. I, I think she doesn't, well, I, I won't give any spoilers or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> she's not there with everyone at the beginning, but her presence is felt very acutely by all of the characters. And, um, and that's very important, I think, to, to kind of intertwining things and, and figuring out how to make her character arc her point of view um, work with my writing style, which is to keep things moving and keep everything mm-hmm. um, kind of, you know, keep the pacing happening and all that. Yeah. So I was able to read several chapters of this long ago in a writing group that we had formed. And it was interesting to read the final version in the arc that you gave me uh, because those early chapters they're all still here, but they're written differently. And like, I was trying to identify, well, you know, just from memory. So obviously it was, it was largely ineffective. Uh, you know, what about the previous chapter? Is he trying to change the focus? Is he trying to draw out different things? And in many cases, it just felt like you rewrote it because you knew you could do it better. Not necessarily because there was more or different things that needed to be included. Uh, what kind of rewrites did you do? Because I know you rewrote, you know, hundreds of thousands of words to, <laughs> to end up with this final product. Yeah, I mean, gosh, this book is what uh, I think two hundred fifteen thousand words, so my longest book to date, and I think I probably wrote five to six hundred thousand words for it, which is by far the most words I've written for any single book ever. Yeah, by probably at least twice as many. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so oftentimes my rewrites tend to be, it tends to be very instinctual. If I reach a point in my writing, especially early in the book, the, when I get later in the book, things, the dominoes have been set up and I usually, it goes pretty smoothly. Um, but early in the book, oftentimes what will happen is that I will hit a wall of some kind. And, you know, people will describe this as writer's block. You know, it's, you know, writer's block mm-hmm. is one of those weird things that, kind of is just a catch-all term for a bunch of different symptoms of, you know, a, a writer struggling to get something down. Yeah. And, uh, but I'll hit a wall of some kind and I'll realize this isn't quite working for me. I don't want to write the next scene that I have planned. 
And usually when I realize that I don't want to write the next scene, it means that the next scene isn't worth writing. It means that whatever I've got planned isn't quite right. And, uh, and sometimes, sometimes that requires massive rewrites. And sometimes that just requires me to kind of stop and say, okay, this character motivation isn't quite leading us into the next scene. How do I spruce that up a little bit to make it more interesting, more to make it more interesting to me, you know, cause oftentimes I'm not necessarily thinking about the reader when I'm writing these. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about what is fun to me. What is making me want to keep writing? And, you know, and as, as uh, creatively bankrupt as I am, um, pay, the paycheck isn't always enough to make me keep writing something. <laughs> I, I think that that is true of most authors, right? We are always our first and most important audience that if it's not fun for me, why am I doing it? You know, and I've definitely done things that were a paycheck. Often that's what write for hire turns into. But when it's our own stuff and it's my baby and it's the thing that I came up with, then yeah, I'm going to write for myself. And if the rest of you are interested in reading along, that's great. So, so yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Hello, Page Break listeners. Brian here to let you know that my next epic fantasy, In the Shadow of Lightning, is now up for pre-order from Tor Books. Glass Immortals is a whole new universe that introduces you to assassinations, intrigue, industrial magic, harrowing battles, heartbreaking disasters, and more for new readers and old. The book is out in the U.S. on June 21st and can be pre-ordered from Amazon, Audible, Barnes & Noble, or get a signed copy straight from my website. Remember, pre-orders matter massively to a new book, so make sure you get that done. Thank you all so much for the support. Now enjoy the rest of the podcast. Now, one change that I do remember, and I apologize to any listeners out there who were like, will they just shut up about the gritty nuts and bolts of writing? No, I'm not going to, because this is what's <laughs> fascinating to me, talking to other authors. I, I like to know about these distinct revision changes, not just tell me about your book. Tell me why it's this book and not a different book. I remember reading an early scene with Demir where I swear he met with his mother. Was that in there in an original version? Oh, man, I'm trying to think. And, and now, like, she's dead, like, in his second chapter. First time we hear of her, she's been murdered. Oh, no, that was um, that was his aunt that you met. His made. aunt. Okay. Yeah. No, the very, very first iteration of this was actually going to be that Demir was from a, a one of the larger guild families. Uh -huh. And so he was just kind of a smaller piece in the in the cog. Um, he was and, and he was like. And man, there had, there was a lot of, a lot more kind of family machinations in the original, the very original pitch. His aunt was the, uh, was the, uh, the guild family matriarch. He was only heir because her, both of her daughters had killed themselves. Like there was, it was, it was quite dark actually. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so there was, yeah, there was a lot more. In fact, I'm trying to, yeah. In fact, Amir was a little bit of a different person in those original drafts. In fact, the the whole magic system was quite different. I had had I had had this magic system that I had uh, that was all I called it clay making, and it was it was this idea that that these that people could I don't know it was I I really struggled to describe it, which is why I eventually dropped it. It looked very cool in my head, but I could not get the words to work succinctly for the reader or for myself to be frank. <laughs> and, uh, and so that magic system got dropped and, uh, and Demir. And eventually I realized that introducing Demir as just one character in a larger guild family, it required too much explaining. If I wanted to jump into the politics and jump into the action of the world. Mm -hmm. And so I eventually trimmed that down to him just being the only son, the only kind of the last member of his really tiny once prestigious guild family and uh but he also was a genius uh, and that was a change that he kind of turned into um a failed genius who was really very intelligent and could handle being the you know this last member of his guild family but 
also had a lot more emotion, emotional baggage. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this current iteration of the story uh, streamlines his motivations so much, um, and it allows you to tell a much larger story, frankly. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I can imagine that there are people out there listening and saying, no, I, I love interfamily machinations. And yes, those are cool. But uh, when you are trying to explain interfamily politics while also having, you know, this much larger political story, uh, then you're really trying to tell two different and contradictory stories at the same time, which A, is not always worth it. And B, in this case, getting rid of that allows you to uh, kind of make Demir a much more complicated character, frankly. Uh, the story is a, is slightly simpler than it could have been, which allows the character to be much more interesting uh, in comparison. So now I'd like to hear the other side. You know, we talked about some of the stuff that you that you uh, added into the story, and you you cut out the clay making thing because it just wasn't working. You cut out that family politics because it wasn't working. What's some stuff that you wanted to put into the story that wasn't in those early drafts? And you're like, now I'm going to be able to add in this thing. Well, uh, funny enough, because earlier we were kind of, uh, we were talking about that uh, magic system as like a genetic marker kind of mm -hmm. thing that's so common in epic fantasy. I wanted that. Um, I, and that was what the clay making was going to be. Because I, you know, I tend to have multiple magic systems in my books. And I wanted to do, I wanted to do the God glass and I wanted to do something that was inherent to the characters to, or some characters and have those be two separate things. And I knew that from the beginning. And like I said, the clay making kind of just, just didn't work. And, uh, and so glass dancing ended up replacing the clay making and glass dancing is, is fun in a couple of ways. One it's, so it's basically glass based telekinesis. Characters that uh, through um, through a genetic anomaly can control glass with their mind. They can move it around. They can reshape it. And I I was interested in this idea of something like that. Um, both because it's really fun for me as the author to play with in in a societal and military sense, which is what I did with Powder Mage, and I'm quite good at it. And uh, but also because I really I loved the idea of giving Demir a very powerful magic that he rejects inherently. He's a glass dancer, which is considered in this society to be, you know, you are, you are a badass. Nobody messes with you. Yeah. If you're yeah. a glass dancer, you will probably be adopted into one of the major guild families. If you're not already a member, um, you're, you are going to live a life of luxury and, and anybody, nobody messes with you at all. And I like this idea that Demir, as a person, he has this sorcery that's very powerful, and he doesn't particularly like it. He likes solving problems w by thinking through them, by convincing people that he's right. And uh, he, like I said earlier, he's a politician at heart. He really, he wants to help people. He wants to resolve conflicts. He wants... He's he's a he's a bit of a hedonist. He wants everybody to get along so they can all have fun. That's mm -hmm. almost the core of his character, which <laughs> I really I really love that. And so giving him this powerful sorcery that he barely uses because he doesn't he's not that interested in it uh, really helped make his character multifaceted and gave me something that I could play with with other characters, other glass dancers that he meets and he can kind of play off of in terms of you know, how they feel about their sorcery and their place in society. All right. So let me ask this because uh, I was I was curious about this anyway, and you've just segued us perfectly into it. When we played Typecast together, we were in, uh, we, we ran a Twitch show uh, for years where we were playing D&D &D on Twitch uh, and you and I and Charlie Holmberg started the whole thing. Uh, your first character, what was his first name? It was Lacoust. Oh, Krustoff. Yeah. Krustoff Lacoust, and uh, you always described him, his alignment was chaotic friendly. <laughs> like, he was exactly what you described with Demir. He wanted everyone to get along so they could all just have fun. Uh, he didn't want to have to take things seriously. He didn't want to have to solve problems. He is much more into debauchery than Demir is, but there's definitely a lot of commonality between the two characters, and I'm curious if that was on purpose at all. 
uh, Kristoff was a little bit of a um, a little bit of a testing board for Demir because uh, it was right about the same time I was starting to really develop the characters mm-hmm. for the world for In Shadow of Lightning, and um, and so yeah, it was very much a uh, this is a concept I find kind of funny and interesting, um, and I I started playing with it on the show and very quickly, probably immediately, started developing it into this character that I was going to use for a book. But like you said, they they kind of diverge in different ways because De- Demir very much enjoys solving problems. He he yeah. kind of likes being he likes being the person not necessarily in charge, but it, the person that does all the fiddly bits. And uh you know and and the character that I did for the D&D show very much didn't, you know, he he just wanted to lay on a couch all day. Yeah. And uh and Demir's Demir's much more proactive in in his in his debauchery. Uh <laughs> he uh but it's also a character. It's it's a it's part of his character flaw that he sees as an older person because before he had a mental breakdown and disappeared he had been this child prodigy. He was the governor of a province at the age of 14. Very intelligent, very good at things. But he also had this reputation for, you know, as a teenager, sleeping with everyone and just an absolute cad in every sense of the way. Like, and and so he he was he was an old soul, you know, kind of hedonist as a kid almost. Mm -hmm. And now we look at his character, he's 29 in the book. um, And he looks back at himself and sometimes goes, what was I? You know, like this, (laughs) you know, this person that I was and that everyone kind of, as he's returned to the capital and people are starting to, you know, notice that he's back and remember, Oh, this is the guy that was, you know, as a kid, he was debating people in the assembly and he was really brilliant. You know, as, as people are noticing he's returned, they're also remembering his, you know, a lot of his, you know, better and worse uh, reputations. And so he kind of looks at that as, you know, was, was I just, you know, kind of a child with adult sense with adult appetites and adult sensibilities and responsibilities you know, and what do I do with that now going forward? And I really like that too. It's it's mm-hmm. really fun to play with someone who's not even that old, but has a such a life of you know kind of regrets and strange things that he went through and did. Not not I was I'll, I was going to ask if maybe there was an early draft where Demir was much more like Krustov, but it sounds like even in the current draft. His childhood, he was Krustov, and he just grew out of it, uh, and is now trying to grapple with that a little bit. Yeah, that's very interesting. How much of that is uh, author insert? Because you have always felt older than you are, right? <laughs> uh, and so, you know, how much of this sense of he's young, but he's been around for a while, and he's kind of already tired and and already uh, looking back on a lot of stuff. How much of that is just Brian? <laughs> well, the maybe the old soul part. Um, you know, like that, I, I definitely, I've definitely always felt like an old person, um, you know, even when I was 16. Uh, but, uh, you know, in terms of Demir's kind of, there are things, you know, when you're an author, you often self insert even tiny things into the Mm -hmm. characters you develop. I think Demir, the self insert is actually a regret. The self insert into Demir is the regret that I wasn't more proactive as a young person, um, I was a very timid, you know, kind of up to about 27, 28, <laughs> a very timid person, just always lurking in the background, always afraid of crowds, always afraid of talking to girls, you know, like there's lots of things that I struggled with as a kid. And Demir is the opposite of all that. Demir is somebody who was able to be charming and intelligent and accomplish things. Uh, and, and some of that is for him. Some of that is good. And some of that is bad. You know, he references a couple times in the book that he didn't really get a childhood like his friends all did. He was, because he was brilliant. He, uh, he was noticed to be brilliant and all these expectations were put on his shoulders from a very young age. And I, you know, I never had that kind of thing. I just, I, I kind of lurked as, 
as far back as I possibly could. You know, when I was a kid, my favorite place to be was in my room playing a video game or reading a book. And, you know, when my dad tried to be like, oh, you should, you know, you're, you're 15, 16, you should go get a job, you know, like I'll introduce you to a friend of mine who has, who has a, a barn that they could use some help around the there and you can get some spending money for the summer. And, you know, I always rejected that. Like I did, I never saw, um, the idea of making a little bit more money and preparing for college or being able to buy my own car or things like that. I was never able to have any perspective on this is a good thing. And I would actually really enjoy the, the output of my labor. Um, mm-hmm. As a kid, I was always just, you know, leave me alone. I just want to hide and just, you know, pass the time. And, uh, and so Demir is the opposite of that. And I, I it, because I find that very cool in a lot of ways, you know, people who are, from a young age, you know, it's the type of person, you know, in the Midwest where I grew up, you know, the, the type of teenager who starts mowing neighbors' lawns and by the time they're 20 owns their own landscaping company. Um, it's that kind of thing that I wish I had done when I was a kid. Mm, interesting. That that is that is interesting to hear and not what I expected. Do you have like I know you 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 said you'd like to read and stuff. Were you considered gifted as a child? Um, off and on. <laughs> I was I was never good at at the kind of the maths and sciences. Uh when it came to reading, reading comprehension, um writing, I was very much considered gifted. Um okay. writing contests were a breeze. I never put any effort into anything and I still tended to pass all my classes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it depended on the class. If it required a lot of memorization, I would pass barely. Um, if it was English class where I just had to write some things and spell stuff, right. Um, I'd get an A without trying. Yeah. So it was kind of, kind of back and forth, you know, every, everybody's mom always thinks they're gifted. Right. And so my mom was always kind of, you know, (laughs) needling at that, like, oh, let's, let's get you into, let's get you into the advanced classes. Let's, uh, you know, I don't remember what it was called, but in elementary school, you know, there was like that group of you know seven or eight kids that were all considered brilliant and they they got their own like like one or two classes a day where it was just the the, you know the small group of them with a teacher uh, half goofing off and halfing half solving you know kind of more advanced high school level stuff and i remember my mom trying to get me into that when i was you know what it was fourth fourth or fifth grade and I had zero interest and I think that that is, and, and so I just never cared. I never engaged at all. I never tried to pass any of the weird little standard tests that they gave you to let you into the class. Uh And, and like I said, with maths and sciences, which is what those things focused on at the time. Anyways, um, I, I didn't really have it. I wasn't gifted at all, but you know, and then, you know, like, you know, and then I later on, I took the SAT without studying and I got a 790 out of 800 on the, the English part mm-hmm. or the writing comprehension part. And, you know, that, like, so that kind of stuff has always come easy to me. Yeah. And I've, I've always been part of the reason why it's come easy to me is because I hate prepping for things. I hate memorizing things. But if you give me something and say, using some creativity you can probably bullshit your way to a perfect grade. Oh man, I'm all over that. You know, give me oh. some creative leeway. Yeah. And I can do that. Absolutely. That that was me in school as well. You know, any class, English was the best, but any class where writing is how you answer the problem. In math, there's a right answer. Yeah. History, if you can convince someone you have the right answer, then you get an A. Uh, and, and I love that. And the reason I ask this question is because it's become such a meme today, uh, you know, for the kids who were gifted. I was, I was in accelerated programs and stuff in, in school as well. Uh, kids who were gifted as children grow up and find that adulthood is somehow even, even harder for them than for other people. Uh, maybe because school was so easy just because of the way their brain worked. Or they, you know, grew up with people telling them that they were awesome and then they're faced with the real world and realize they don't have actual skills. Uh, you know, you most people can't pay the bills by writing essays, you know? Yeah. So even though we were super great at that in seventh grade, 
that doesn't really help anymore. Uh, though it does explain why you and I both became authors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I see so much of that in Demir, you know, the child prodigy who as a kid was so good at everything and, and was able to just do all this, you know, like you say, without studying, without having to try. And then adulthood hit him like a ton of bricks. And, you know, you've got that absolutely devastating prologue where uh, the city that he has defeated gets plundered and destroyed by the army and that it just breaks him that his all of the skills that he has all of the things that have gotten him where he is they are useless in that situation the real world takes these kinds of people and chews them up and spits them out and i just thought it was so interesting to see that uh portrayed so well and uh you know reflected i think a really common experience for for those kind of kids that's that it was it was really cool yeah yeah and i i it was funny because i originally i think i mentioned this but I, uh, but originally demir was meant to be he was he was very smart and very talented and i realized at some point that he that it was boring um because he was also very self-assured and and I was like, ah, okay, it's because you know I wanted to. I always have am fascinated by like kind of those those people that that history remembers. You know, Napoleon and Alexander, and you know those type of people. And I wanted to Demir to be a young version of that kind of person. Um, but I realized very quickly that that it, making him quite brilliant and all around was a bit boring, and so. I had to inject something in there that uh, took him down a peg. Um, and it turns out I took him down many pegs. <laughs> and, and, and you know, you take somebody like that and you, like you said, you, you put them into the real world and have them chewed up and spit out. And I wanted to see how that looked and, you know, what kind of a person comes out the other side of that and how they, what their struggles are. You know, because he's still brilliant. He's still a very intelligent person that's good at solving problems, but he has no self confidence, and he has, um, and he has the weight of all of these mistakes that he feels he's made, and and some of them he has made, and putting that kind of emotional baggage on him makes him way more complex and interesting. Yeah, and you've managed to do it without making him angsty which is always the problem, right? He's not constantly bemoaning his faults. Uh, he's not constantly sad about all the things he could have done. Uh, he'll occasionally think, I wish I was here. I maybe could have kept my mom alive, things like that. Uh, but he uses that as incentive to do better rather than just constantly wallowing in his failures, which I find really interesting. Uh, you know, in, in speaking of the great men of history, uh, the one that Demir keeps reminding me of is Simon Bolivar, who's kind yeah. of like, you know, the South American Napoleon or George Washington in a lot of ways, except that he failed horrifically for like 10 or 20 years before he finally got everything in a row and he was just constantly trying. Uh, but he would lose battles. He would lose political fights. Uh, he was exiled a couple of times. Uh, and then he just kept coming back and trying and eventually got everything in place and is today, you know, heralded as one of the great men of history, uh, mostly just because he never gave up. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of stuff is fascinating to me. <laughs> Something that I was just thinking about that I also really wanted to do with this book uh, is explore in some ways, and I, I think that we'll probably get more of this in book two, um, but explore the type of people, the, the type of support network, I suppose you'd call it in modern day terms, that somebody like this would have or need to kind of get through because you you mentioned a few times that Demir does have he does have some he has some self reproach and he he mm -hmm. does work through it quickly each time but part of the reason he's able to work through it is because he has a few people in his life who are able to kind of help him and i i wanted to examine a little bit of this idea of of friends who are emotionally available to a character and uh, and and so i have Demir's best friend is this retired world champion cudgelist um cudgeling is kind of the, the the national sport of this empire and so his best friend is this man named montego who um it's his adopted brother and it's his best friend 
and Montego is basically Demir's. It's he's like Demir's rock. He is the person who is he's the backstop that just supports Demir in anything, mm-hmm. and is able to be there and tell him, "Look, it's okay. You're going to do fine." And I I really liked that. I I feel like it's kind of a positive. Um, a positive way to have characters interact in a book like this. Yeah, I uh, I thought it was really interesting, you know, looking at his support characters, that one of his close friends is Idrian, the Breacher, who's a big, tough dude who's large and imposing. And his other friend is Baby Montego, who's a big, tough dude who's large and imposing. And I thought, well, that's that's interesting. Why, why is this archetype in here twice? But the difference is that emotional component that you're talking about. Uh, because Idrian absolutely has his own things going on. Uh, he likes Demir, but he also kind of dislikes and distrusts him in equal measure. Uh, uh, whereas Montego is like, nope, this is my bro, and I'm with him, ride or die. And uh, there's a very different emotional component, uh, even though at different points in the story, he always has the big wall of meat that he can rely on to help him <laughs> through things. Yeah, and I and I love that. You know, all of my somebody, I think it was my wife Michelle who pointed out that every single one of my books has a big dude who is supportive of one of the main characters. And, uh, and that's totally true. I, I, I always, I, I always kind of end up writing these kind of, you know, bigger is sometimes gregarious characters. Um, I'm not even sure why. I think it's just an archetype I really like. I mean, at the risk of of making this personal, is it because you're short? <laughs> I mean, maybe uh, all of my, my like close high school friends, are all over six feet tall. Really? There is, I think one of them is less than six feet tall and he's still like three inches taller than me. There, there, there is a photo I took about five years ago with a big group of my high school buddies who had come to visit. And there's, I think there's like seven or eight of us. And uh, we were up in the mountains and having a fun time. And we had somebody take a photo, a group photo of us. And I am literally standing on a rock and I am shorter than all of those people by a significant <laughs> margin. And so, yeah, I, I, I've spent my whole life around v- quite tall people. And it's, yeah, and I am quite short. And it's and it's a weird dynamic. Because when I was younger, I was always very resentful of being short. Um, I hated it. Mm-hmm. And there was some point in my life, probably when I became a successful author and that instilled a bit of self-confidence in me where things just kind of flipped and I just didn't care anymore. Um, But there's very much that subconscious kind of, you know, like, you know, the people that have my back are all tall kind of thing. (laughs) Well, let's ask about that uh, because you talked about how, you know, you, you were very timid for years and years and years. And today you're not. Uh, you are a very outgoing, very you know capable and accomplished person. Was it getting published that changed? What happened around 27, 28 and kind of changed things for you? Yeah, I think it was I think it was getting published. There was it's kind of a weird thing because I always wanted to be a more outgoing person than I've been. and and sometimes I've succeeded at it and uh, but mostly, Mostly, I've always had a really hard time with kind of a comfort zone and being in kind of louder, more crowded situations has always been hard for me. And even just talking to people that I find even slightly intimidating was always very hard for me. Uh, But yeah, but when I got published, I was not an immediate like breakout success as like an author. You know, it took several years for Powder Mage to kind of catch up and and really become like a consistent source of income and like kind of a feel good thing that I could look at and say, this thing, it made my career. Um, But when I did, it really gave me like this huge boost of self-confidence. It it felt like the first thing in my life that I had done on my own, you know, like I I wasn't kind of handed anything for it. I kind of, it, it let me kind of be my own man in a way I had never tried to be or succeeded at, at any way um, when I was younger. And, and so, yeah, it, it definitely it instilled kind of this big jolt of, you know, kind of confidence and ability to look at things and say, I can solve problems. I can handle things. I can handle talking to people. I can handle being in social situations. And even to 
to today, I, I do get worn out. You know, I, lots of authors deal with that. Yeah. You go to a convention, you spend two to five days, you know, in a huge crowd talking to people for a long time. And when I get home from those kind of things, I like look at my wife and I go, I don't want to talk to anyone, including you. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to go hide in my office for a few days and, and you know, you know kind of let that that we, that energy get away from me. And, uh, and so I still have some of that, but, um, it definitely did. It felt like it changed kind of who I was. And I, I don't know if other writers have that experience or other people who have become successful at something after being a very timid person. And I think a part of it maybe for me was that I always wanted to be a more outgoing person and I could just could never get a hold of it. And so when the, when the confidence was presented to me, I was able to take it and run with it. Yeah. And, uh, and that helped a lot. I, I find this fascinating because it takes a lot of confidence to even get to that point, you know, to uh, just the sheer audacity of thinking to yourself, I'm going to write something down and it's going to be so good. Other people are going to want to read it. That takes a lot of confidence even to get out the door in the first place. And so to do that, to write, you know, book after book, I don't know how many books you wrote that were terrible before they, before you sold one. Uh, for me, it was five awful books. And then I sold number six and, you know, getting to that point where you overcome, you know, timidity after timidity, first to write something, then to show it to people, then to try to sell it to people, that already takes a lot of confidence. But at the same time, it absolutely makes sense to me that you are able to kind of turn that confidence, that that burst of approval. Somebody actually bought my book. My confidence paid off in a way that I didn't necessarily expect it to or have never experienced before. And then you were able to redirect all of that good energy into, well, if I succeeded at this one thing, then I can succeed at other things, you know? Yeah. Well, and I, I think uh, because so making stuff up is the only thing that childhood Brian was confident in. <laughs> and so that's probably where that kind of that uh, that kind of audacity to say that I'm going to write this and people will like it. It came from that. You know, when I was in kindergarten, I half convinced my mom that we were learning Spanish you know, for a good week or two. <laughs> you know, like when I was in third grade, I won a little contest uh, uh, writing a, a silly little short story um, adventure. Uh, it was a little writing contest for the, you know, the third grade. And uh, when I was in, I think it was my junior year of high school, I wrote something in about we, we were given the computer lab for uh, the full week. And we were told, okay, you go in, you write for a full week and you're going to, you, we want you to write a story beginning, middle, end, etc. It has to be, I don't remember like 500 words or something. It was not long. It was just like two or three pages. And, um, and, and we were told that, and I spent four and a half days playing video games on the computers. <laughs> and in the last 30 minutes of that class, I I just abs I just totally bullshitted my way through a story that my teacher found so funny and engaging that she read it out loud at the beginning of class on Monday. <laughs> and and so like that kind of thing that like so so I had this string of things that that gave me the confidence to say, okay, I'm actually good at this one thing. You know, I went to a I went to a, a class between I want to say it was jun between junior and senior year. It was actually directly because of this little story I wrote. My mom got me uh, into a summer program that was like, I think it was like eight or 10 days or something like that, maybe a week, where I went to a university. Uh, it was BYU, actually, um, for this little summer program. And I did a writing course. And I remember ending that writing course with when my stuff was was workshopped in this group of my peers. I remember the cutest girl in the group <laughs> looking at me and saying, this was the best thing anybody's written this whole week. This is amazing. I love it. And everyone else agreed. And so like that, that kind of thing, I mean, obviously like if I had, if I had already had a big ego, it would have made my head blow up. Yeah. But as someone who was very, you know, timid in every other aspect of his life, having that happen was like, Oh, 
really? Wow, this is okay. I can do this. I do love that progress. Like it's one thing for your teacher to like your writing, but when the cute girl likes your writing, yeah. that's when you realize, oh, okay, this is this is something. <laughs> yeah. I and, and I love that story because I can remember, you know, in second grade writing a poem that got published in some like district newsletter or something. And I often think back to that and wonder how much of my life and career today is based entirely on the fact that in second grade, I published a poem somewhere and just have been writing that high for the last 40 years. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's it's crazy how much those little bits of approval come to defend our personalities <laughs> like oh yeah, it, you you like this shirt well then i'm gonna wear this shirt for the rest of my life yeah you know? oh it's so true it, it is bizarre it's such a strange thing to think about how the little things can just completely change your life and 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 snowball into a career <laughs> and a lifestyle right <laughs> oh that's awesome let me ask uh we'll change gears a little bit uh you write primarily these big, heavy epic fantasies, mm -hmm. but you also do a ton of novellas that you write based in your own worlds and I believe self-pub all of them. And I find that really fascinating that it's not just, you know, here's my trilogy and I'm done, but here's my trilogy. And if you're interested, I've got these other like seven or eight connected stories that are related. They're not part of the actual like you don't need them in order to understand things. It's like you're writing webisodes, you know, like here's bonus content that you can get on the DVD. How did that start? What what led you into doing that? And do you intend to do that with Shadow of Lightning? Um. So, yeah, I. Uh... Uh, it's it's a twofold answer. One is practical and one is creative. Um, the practical answer is that we as writers get paid t twice a year. Um, if if we're making royalties, like it's complicated. I don't, I'm not going to explain the whole thing on the podcast, but yeah. essentially, if you're getting royalties, you're getting paid twice a year. If you're if you're only living off of your um, your advance money that is divvied up into small kind of things that you have to you know goals that you have to reach to get paid, then you're still only getting paid once or twice a year from a you know a book. Yeah. And um, and so you know part of that was me saying okay uh, you know, and this was this was actually I, I started off. I don't want to say early on in self-publishing, but I, I feel like it was when self-publishing was starting to become more of a thing that was accepted. I think my first one might have been 2014, maybe, question mark, where I did a short story and self-published it. But the idea was basically, I had seen, I had I'd read a couple of articles about erotica writers who are basically churning out these little things and making a career out of it. They were able to make decent money. They were able to kind of write small self-contained stories that people enjoyed and would keep buying. And, uh, and I thought, okay, what can I do that as an epic fantasy writer? Can I, can I do something smaller and self-contained that my fans will enjoy and that I can play with on the side and, uh, and that will also give me a monthly income, most importantly? You know, even if it's only $500 or $1,000 a month, that's still, you know, like a, that's still a boost. That's still paying for my rent or my mortgage or whatever, or a car payment. And so, so that's where that, that was kind of the, uh, the financial reasons for doing it. The, the, um, the practical reasons, um, the creative reasons for it was, uh, constantly writing these big epic fantasies that are really complex. It gets exhausting. <laughs> I mentioned on a podcast I was guesting on recently that when you take a, a, a multi point of view epic fantasy and you want to take it up to the next level, which I wanted to do within the shadow of lightning and taking it up to the next level is making it more complex, deeper and more interesting, um, a, a deeper world. If you want to increase that complexity by 10%, you have to put a hundred percent more work into the books just to get that 10% kind of result for the reader. And, and so that's exhausting. It's, it's very tiring. And I realized that if I occasionally stop and I spend a few minutes playing with a smaller idea and, and oftentimes I write these little novellas in the course of like a week or two, but if I give myself some time to play with a smaller idea, it's like a little palate cleanser. It lets my brain kind of reset and and look at and and stop staring at all these gigantic ideas that I have that are 
uh, tend to be very difficult to connect together for the resulting book. Uh, if I if I let myself have these palate cleansers of a smaller, more focused thing, uh, I tend to enjoy the writing of both the small thing and the big thing a lot more. I haven't actually mentioned this uh, you know, publicly at all yet, but I when I w- was in France, I got COVID, and we Michelle and I had to bunker down in a French hotel for six days, which sucked. I had to miss the convention I went out there for. We were basically trapped in this little tiny room. I've been in a French hotel room. They are not large. No, they are so tiny and very expensive. And and so we're trapped in this little room. I had two days where I was on my back. I could not think. I could not. I couldn't even listen to podcasts. My head hurt so badly. Ugh. But then the, by the, the third day, I had I was feeling better. And so over the course of the other four days, I wrote a God Glass novella, just a story about the chi- the childhood of some of these characters. And uh, and now I've got it with some beta readers, and um, and eventually I'll probably late this summer or something like that. Um, I'll end up doing something with it. But so yes, I definitely intend to keep doing it. I kind of stopped doing it for Powder Mage a couple of years ago, and probably because I wasn't actively working on Powder Mage, and so I didn't. My brain didn't want that palate cleanser. It didn't. Mm-hmm. I wasn't looking for something to to you know kind of reset my creativity. And, but with, uh, you know, but being trapped in a French hotel room while I'm, you know, working on book two and just burned out and tired and, you know, you feel like, you know, bleeding money in in France, (laughs) like there's a lot of reasons there for me to say, okay, I'm going to give myself a few days and I'm going to work on something different. And so I did. And it's great. That's awesome. Have there ever been ideas that you came up with for the main book that you eventually decided, no, this should be its own novella or vice versa? That You came up with an idea for a, a little story and then eventually said, this is too cool. I'm going to put it in the main continuity. You know, I, um, I don't think so. Oftentimes my novellas come from throwaway lines that I, that I enjoyed uh, that I felt like had a little bit more depth to them. And I wanted to, and, and usually what I do with a novella is it's a prequel. Um, I rarely set things, I rarely set these little side projects in the modern world. They're almost always prequels. They're almost always something where I want to explore an adventure or a formative moment in a character's life. And so I'll just take like a, I'll take a, a throwaway line that is referencing an event that I probably hadn't even given that much thought to. And I'll say, okay, let's take that and turn it into, and and give thought to it and turn it into a real story. So yeah, like, like the novella that I wrote uh, in France, um, it basically, I looked at my various characters and I thought, okay, I actually, you know, so we have three very close friends, um, Demir and Montego and Kizzy. I want to, I want to know about when they met. I want to know how they kind of became friends. And, mm-hmm. um, and so I, I took it from Montego's point of view as a child and, and becoming adopted by Demir's family and, uh, and growing to know them and, and being a kind of a, so he, he kind of comes as a country bumpkin to the capital and, and the only thing in his family's all, you know, passed away. And the only thing he has is, a promise from these strangers, the this, this small guild family, the Grappo, who his mother died saving one of them in a war years ago. And so, so he has this gift from them basically saying, if you ever need help, you come to us and we will, you know, we'll pay back the debt that we owe you. And so he, as a, a, an orphan, comes to the capital, comes to this, these people he doesn't know. And uh, and tries to fit in and struggles with it and only gets through because he meets these other kids that are you know supportive and kind and and interesting and um, and I so I, I wanted to build on that and develop that and it ended up being a twenty thousand word novella and how much of that is outlined and how much of it do you just start with that core concept of I want to see how these characters met and then just discover it as you write it um, when I am when I'm doing a novella. It's almost always very strictly outlined. I don't do that with my epic fantasy because I feel like when you have multiple point of views and every everything's constantly changing and you're developing the characters as you go and little things change. But with a novella, it's much easier to say, okay, 
I'm going to have, you know, eight to 10 scenes. Each scene is going to be 2,000 to 4,000 words long. And each scene is going to accomplish this, 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 and this. And uh, that I always do. So that was the first thing I did with the um, with this Montego novella that I wrote was just sit down and say, okay, I know the basic premise I want to deal with. You know, what is every scene going to accomplish, and how do I want to end it, and all that. And it it changed a little as I went, but like uh-huh. I wrote it in you know I wrote the ending like the day I got home. I wrote like the second to last scene on the airplane. Wrote the ending the day I got home, and so yeah, I mean that was it was like five days of writing. And, uh, and, and so that wasn't, it wasn't a long development period. It was yeah. all just all tightly done. That's awesome. All right. I want to, I want to end by asking some questions. I don't know if you are familiar with the show, but here on page break, we always like to ask a food question at the end. Uh, but before we do that, I'm curious, I, I've yeah. got some, some questions for you. So number one, what is the first book chapter length book that you remember reading as a kid? Oh man probably it's hard to say when which came first it's either going to be it's either going to be one of the uh chronicles of narnia um because i remember the first one my mom read to me um and i think that i i think that i then read the rest of them myself it's either chronicles of narnia or it's uh the one of the red wall books mm-hmm. i my my standard thing when i was a kid was to take a book and hide underneath the dining room table and read. And I, I have mem- I have a very distinct memory of reading either of those books under the dining room table. And uh, and I don't remember which one was where at first. Probably Chronicles of Narnia, because I think it's a bit more approachable that, than Redwall for a little kid. Is Redwall a series that somebody introduced you to, or did you find it on your own? Um, it was either my mom or a librarian. My mom volunteered at the library, and so I would just go and hang out with her on Wednesday nights, and I'd wander around. And the librarians knew me, and they would, you know, you know, recommend things for me, and and then they'd recommend bigger things once they realized that I read voraciously. Um, so probably either mom or a librarian. So can you remember the first fantasy book or series that you found on your own with no gatekeeper? Ooh, oh, that one's tough. I I don't I don't actually know, you know, because it. When I, when I read a book, you know, like on my own, it was usually because it was sitting around, you know, my brothers all read fantasy books. Um, they, they, none of them like kind of be like kept being readers once they stopped being teenagers. But when I was growing up, I, there was definitely a huge amount of books just kind of left around because they had read them when they were teens. Um, and I'm younger than them by quite a lot. So probably one of the ones that they just kind of left around, there was, uh, man, I want to say it was called something like Last of the Renshai or something like that. Huh, I'm not familiar with it. Man, ugh, I'm probably butchering the name. I, I don't remember what it was. I do remember it was about, I think it was a sequel. I think it wasn't even a sta- like a first novel. <laughs> I think it was part of a wider series. It was about like this really amazing swordsman who, uh, I think he was paralyzed from like the waist down. And so he rode, he rode strapped to a horse into battle with two swords and like, you know, sliced everybody up. Um, I vaguely remember that. And it was just one of those books I found laying around, you know, uh, there was all the Piers Anthony books, which we now don't talk about. Um, (laughs) I never read any of those uh, actually. And I, I can't decide if I'm glad or if I missed out on something. I I I don't have the shared cultural. Ooh, remember those creepy books? Remember when you first realized how skeevy they were? I, I don't have any of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Yeah. If you were given the keys to any intellectual property, Star Wars, Marvel, the X Files, you know, anything at all, and you got to write uh, a book or you know, show run a series or something like that, uh, which which property would you be most interested in driving for a while? Um, okay, I'll give you my gut response, and then I'll give you my real response. My gut response is that I would want to. Um, take all of the pieces that they used for the Boba Fett show and do it right. 
I like I could use the same. I could even use the same setting. Everything that they put into it. You give me all the pieces, but let me rearrange them in an order that I find more interesting. That that's my gut response. My real response would probably be, um, man, a maybe Conan the Barbarian. To be honest, y- you know, I I know that it's considered in a lot of ways quite problematic these days, but it's also so incredibly formative to kind of modern fantasy and modern fantasy writers that there's such like a lovable place for it in my heart that I could probably, I I'd, I'd probably do that. That's cool. I think, I think Conan the Barbarian would be wicked cool to adapt. Uh, I don't think we're too far off from uh, all the old, you know, Conan and Tarzan and John Carter entering public domain that can't be more than a decade or two away. So you might get your chance. Well, and Conan's interesting um, because you could do it. Like if you, if you take out some of the more racist elements and sexist elements, honestly, if you strip out some of those things, you could keep the core of Conan being this womanizing, crazy barbarian, but also have it be interesting and more up to date with our times. Yeah, I I agree. I think that could be really fascinating to do. Okay, here's the final question. Yes. Uh, And this is the page break question. What's the last meal you ate that totally blew your mind? Okay, this one's going to be out of left field. Oh, I'm excited. Before last week... I had never, ever eaten a fresh mango. Really? Yeah. Just never, it's never come up. I never, you know, had never had one at a party. I've never, you know, like I've never bought one. It's just, has never happened. And, uh, yeah, obviously I've had mango, but like dried mango, canned mango, whatever. I've never had a fresh mango before. There are now so many mangoes in my house because <laughs> that was one of the best things I've ever tasted. And that's probably my new favorite fruit. Um, it just so stinking good. I don't know how this just didn't hit my radar before then. And uh, I, I ate two mangoes yesterday. Like, that's so weird to me. I don't really eat a lot of fruit. I, when raspberry season is in and my raspberries are out, I eat tons. But like, otherwise, I'm like, ah, fruit, whatever. I'd rather have a candy bar. Um, holy crap. Mangoes are delicious. And uh, it's not a meal, but it is a food that I am now in love with. That's awesome. Now, uh, you live in Utah, so I don't even know how fresh that mango was comparatively, but... It it was quite good. You know, you get them from Costco, and Costco tends to have good fruit. They they do tend to have pretty good, yeah. Someday, if you get a chance, uh, end up in a, you know, tropical or equatorial region try try some mangoes down there oh yeah i remember remember eating mangoes in mexico that were like semi-liquid because they were so juicy and so fresh that's fantastic awesome well hey brian thank you for coming on the show oh thanks dan thanks for having me this is really kind of you um and honestly, it's it's been exhausting for me to run this show for so long. Do you want to just take over and you be the host from now on? Uh, you know, if you're really if you're really kind of sick of it and and want to move on with your life, then it's it's not that I'm sick of it. I've I've relished the opportunity, but you know, I've got a lot of other things going on. All right, deal. I'll take over. I will leave page break in your hands. Oh, thanks. I will, in yeah. fact, retcon history itself so that you've always been the host. How does that sound? Mind is blown. <laughs> Very good. Oh, well, thank you uh, for telling us all about your book. Thank you, dear listeners, for listening to him and uh, go out and buy In the Shadow of Lightning the instant that it is available to you. I believe it's already up for pre order and it comes out. When? June 21st. June 21st. The day that this episode comes out, it will be out. Yes. So right now you can get in your car and drive to a store and buy it and or order one online. So it's awesome. Uh, I've got it on my nightstand. I'm about halfway through it and I love it. So uh, go buy it. That was guest host Dan Wells kindly chatting with me about my new book. In the Shadow of Lightning is out now in ebook and audio in English-speaking territories and hardcover in the U.S. and Canada. Check my social media or sign up for my newsletter for updates, AMAs, guest appearances, and more. Special thanks to James Sutter for music and Tom Bishop for production. If you'd like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak or buy my books in ebook, paperback, or audio. Don't forget that my new epic fantasy, In the Shadow of Lightning, is now out! You can also get signed copies of my books direct from my website or swag from my Redbubble store. 
Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. Huge thanks to Kyle Anderson, Patrick Hunt, Elijah, Jennifer and Angela Johnson, and Ivor Gulickson for their backing on Patreon. Patreon.